This is Larry Burrell. In exactly 15 minutes, we'll be witnessing a monumental milestone in aviation history. To help us cover the event, we have other reporters strategically located. Over to you, Mike. We're speaking to you from the Long Beach Airport Tower. This is Michael Rye, and from our vantage point, we will be bringing you reports of the important moments as they occur. Now we'll switch you over to camera number three. This is Art Ballinger standing by at Edwards Air Force Base. This is Kurt Sanders. I'll be reporting to you from the camera chase plane. This is really an open day. It's the day of the first flight of the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. The DC-10 team and the corporation have a right to be justly proud. And with us today is the president of McDonnell Douglas Corporation, Mr. David Lewis. Mr. Lewis, this has been a corporation-wide endeavor, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, every division of our company has had a very major role to play. Of course, the heart of the program, the integration of the DC-10 is here at Long Beach. Also in California, at Santa Monica, the boys up there have built the cockpit, done a great job, the uh, pylons, and so on. Was the Canadian and St. Louis divisions involved in this? Yes, uh, McDonnell Aircraft designed the wing, uh, built part of the wing, but the main talk box, the structure of the wing, was built in Canada. A Tulsa plant also built uh, a lot of major components of the wing. And, of course, in addition to our company, there are many of America's great corporations have participated as subcontractors. You see on the sign there the engines by GE. Uh, General Dynamics built the uh, fuselage, LTV, the tail. The vertical tail was built in Italy and uh, so on. Many of the great companies in our nation participate. So, so this is not only a corporation-wide effort, it's a nationwide effort then. It sure is, and we've got a great team on this program. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Lewis. In just a few minutes now, the DC-10 will take to the sky. But prior to any first flight, it's customary to roll the plane out, to present it to the public for the first time. That happened a few days ago. There were many distinguished guests, and they were welcomed by James McDonald. Mr. Vice President, Governor Reagan, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the rollout. We're honored to be joined here today by so many distinguished guests from all over the world. They represent government, the diplomatic corps, the armed forces, the airline industry, the financial community, and our own aerospace industry. Vice President Agnew had this to say. What does this aircraft signify for us? Why do so many of us from all areas of the world gather for the rollout of a single plane? Let me suggest an answer. It signifies the role of business in America. It signifies the contributions of the aeronautics industry. And it signifies the struggles and success of two men. Roll on, old DC-10. Rollout is behind us, and the initial flight of Douglas Commercial No. 10 is just minutes away. We've asked Mr. Jackson McGowan, president of the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, to talk to us about this third-generation jet transport. Mr. McGowan, the DC-10 has been referred to as a new concept in air travel, and we hear words like flexibility, efficiency, and new standards of comfort for passengers. Could you elaborate on those? Flexibility in this sense means the ability to operate the airplane in a variety of missions and roles over a large uh, a spectrum of range from 200 miles to 6,000 miles. What about the efficiency of the aircraft? How will this affect uh, airline operation? The airplane, in order to be successful, must be efficient in terms of cost per seat and cost per ton. And therefore, must, it must be efficient to permit it to be operated at a profit. Could you tell us about some of the new ideas you have in the DC-10 in regard to passenger comfort? The DC-10 is uh, much more advanced in terms of interior arrangement. It has wider seats. It has two aisles. It has uh, new concepts of galleys and food service. 
and I think it will <clears throat> be very acceptable uh, to the passengers. Now, we hear so much about noise and smoke alleviation in these days of uh, where ecology is the center of attention. How will this airplane affect those two, noise and uh, smoke? Our tests indicate that the DC-10 will be uh, smokeless and with a minimum of noise, far better than anything now flying throughout the next 10 years. Thank you very much, Mr. McGowan. Now we take you to Art Ballinger at Edwards Air Force Base. The DC-10 will be powered by General Electric or Pratt & Whitney engines. This first DC-10 will fly with engines built by GE. So let's talk about them for a moment. This is the CF-6 high bypass engine designed for the DC-10 Series 10 aircraft. GE turned on 13 seven-foot fans to try and blow out its newest commercial jet engine. But the engine won every time. Tests were conducted right here at Edwards Air Force Base with the CF-6 mounted on the wing of a B-52. The CF-6 has operated at speeds of Mach 0.869 and to altitudes of 45,000 feet. Air start capabilities have been demonstrated at altitudes up to 35,000 feet. Throughout the entire test program, the CF-6 has operated virtually smoke-free. And now, back to Long Beach and Larry Burrell. With us is John Brizendine, the Vice President and General Manager of the DC-10 program. We understand, John, that the DC-10 we're seeing today is just the first member of a whole new family of DC-10s already on order. That's correct. Uh, there are four members of the DC-10 family that uh, have been ordered by the world's airlines. Uh, this first model is uh, what we call Series 10. It's a domestic airplane. It will fly from very short routes to transcontinental routes uh, in the order of uh, 3,000 miles in range. It's uh, big brothers, so to speak, uh, really stretch out in range and fly up to 6,000 uh, miles range, uh, carrying its full passengers and, and payload. Uh, they're the Series 20, powered by uh, Pratt & Whitney engines, and uh, the Series 30, powered by uh, larger 50,000-pound thrust General Electric engines. When will we be seeing the other DC-10 family members taking to the air? The uh, longer range uh, Series 20 and 30 will uh, fly uh, and be certified about one year after uh, this first model. So we'll see them uh, in airline service in late 1972. Then followed uh, shortly thereafter by uh, the convertible freighter uh, DC-10, which can carry passengers or freight or combinations of both. Do you expect the DC-10 family to continue to grow in the future? Absolutely. Uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, we have the uh, basis for a large family that uh, can fill uh, the markets, uh, the airline needs uh, for many, many years to come. Thank you very much, John. Howard Cleveland is vice president in charge of manufacturing. Howard, what is your concept of assembly and manufacturing? Well, <clears throat> originally on the DC-10, we decided to make a modular type airplane. This, in fact, would give us a instant airplane uh, down the line. So what we have done is utilize the engineering drawings into what we call as a development fixture, establishing our modular concept. In this way, I mean we take various sections of the airplane, we can stuff them with all the installations that are required prior to joining the airplane into the total uh, complex. For instance, our B section, which is the nose section, uh, the C and D, the E barrel, the wing, and the uh, FG are joined together to make a complete airplane. In this way, we have made our schedule and all of our milestones so that down the road, when we get to our final installations, we will have sold our airplane to our customer prior to going to the flight ramp. This in itself has been a great asset, even on our first airplanes. That's a great idea. Now, the big question, what about schedule? On schedule, we're going to fly 17 days ahead of schedule on our first airplane. Our next airplane in flight will probably fly at least 17 days ahead. And this, uh, we relate back to the teamwork that has been here at the Douglas Company, from the engineering right on through to the 
hourly person in manufacturing. Here are some of those manufacturing milestones as they have occurred over the past few months, beginning with the golden rivet in the first DC-10 windshield, instant airplane. Well, this is Bob Hage, Vice President in Charge of Engineering at McDonnell Douglas. Bob, what are the advantages of the airlines selecting the advanced technology Trijet DC-10? Well, Larry, first of all, it's a beautiful airplane to behold. And as we're going to see in a few minutes, which we've already determined from our test, it's going to fly beautifully. In addition to that, the DC-10 uh, will offer a comfort level that the passengers are going to like better than any airplane that we know of flying today or flying in the foreseeable future. It has a performance potential and range that's tremendous, and it's going to make some money for the airlines. Does the airplane have growth potential? It has a lot of growth potential. When it was originally designed, it uh, was designed so that it had a big wing to meet low-speed uh, handling qualities out of airports like LaGuardia. It had a power plant that had a tremendous growth potential. Putting these two together, gave it a range growth potential, as in the DC-10-30, out to 5,300 nautical miles, which is about the same as the DC-8-62, but with twice the payload. Now, what is the advantage of the configuration of the three engines? We believe three engines uh, really is a balanced design from all aspects. From a standpoint of arrangement, we've, we've learned how to, how to place that third engine. And with a straight through airflow, it's just as efficient as the other two engines on the wing. In addition to that, the three engine airplane has advantages in performance, particularly as it comes out of a field, it, it climbs at a rapid angle so that the noise is less than for four engine airplanes, for example. Uh, we feel it's safer too. So all in all, we just know that a three engine airplane is an ideal number of engines to do the kind of a job that the airlines want to do over the next two decades. Now, Bob, this may sound like a rather strange question in talking about a brand new airplane, but when will the DC-10 be obsolete? Well, as I just said, I think uh, in about uh, two decades, I think John Brizendine talked to you a little bit about the, the DC-10 family. Well, we believe the DC-10 is going to last for a long time for about four fundamental reasons. It's the right size body, it has an advanced technology engine already, and we don't see too many improvements coming along subsonically. It has the right speed, and we don't foresee that airplanes are going to be traveling supersonically in large numbers for a long, long time. Thank you, Bob.
We've been talking to Bob Hage, vice president in charge of engineering. The flight crew is now aboard the plane, and in just a few moments, the high stair and the fence will be taken away, and the first flight of the DC-10 will become history. We're talking with Ray Lanahan of Interior Design Program Engineering. Ray, how did you go about creating this tremendous feeling of openness inside the DC-10? One of the main things was to relocate the passenger conveniences from overhead down into the seat area so that the passenger could have them without the interference to the entertainment system, such as the movies, the hi-fi, and the look of the openness to each wide aisle on each side of the aircraft. What other design considerations associated with the interior have been incorporated into the DC-10? The capability of the individual customer to customize his interior to his liking with respect to the color of materials uh, on the seats, on the floor, the decoration of the artwork on the murals, as well as the side panels where the custom is made for the individual. Each airline makes its own specifications then? That is true with a DC-10. Thank you very much, Ray. This is Douglas Aircraft's chief pilot, Jaime Heimerdinger. He and Cliff Stout, the project pilot, helped design the DC-10 cockpit. Jaime, what were your main design objectives? Our main uh, design objectives were to have a real spacious cockpit for comfort of the crew. We also designed in it uh, simplicity because we knew we were going to design an airplane that would be taking uh, passengers safely into uh, weather conditions that can be zero, zero. And we have uh, also incorporated uh, visibility that we think is best in any transport airplane that will be flying in, a, in the next century. Oh, that's great. What are the takeoff specifications? As uh, the airplane is sitting out there right now, and he's coming up to thrust, he will have 40,000 pounds of thrust in each engine, which there are three, and when he releases the brakes, he will monitor the air speeds as he's coming down the runway, and he will have a chance to make a decision of uh, stop or to continue his takeoff at 130 knots, and if he continues, which we know he will, he will lift off at 152 knots. I see, well and now, this is the moment of truth Cliff Stout is about to take the DC-10 up for the first time. As a fellow test pilot, can you give us an idea of what may be going through his mind? Well, I think that uh, things that will be going through his mind is just prior to uh, releasing the brakes is to get all the correlation of all the radio uh, communications. And he is standing by for the tower here to clear him. And when they say, uh, you're cleared for takeoff, he will release the brakes, and from then on, he's in command. Dago 10, Long Beach Tower, runway 1-2, cleared for takeoff. The plane is rolling. Is this the first time you've witnessed a first flight? Yes, sir. And what do you think of it? I think it's fabulous. I see you have the whole family here today. Yes, I do. Pretty exciting day, isn't it? Really. Are you a member of the DC-10 team? Yes, I am. What most impressed you about the DC-10? Well, I think it's uh, good for traveling. I'm from Europe, so anything that <laughs> would give cheaper fares is fine with me. From the camera chase plane, this is Kurt Sanders reporting. Our job is to describe the DC-10 during its first flight, but as you can see, things are going so smoothly that we've decided to let the 10 speak for itself, as it's doing right now quite eloquently.
We're now back in the data control center. Flight test information is relayed here. Well, let's go to the source and talk to George Jansen. Hi, George. Hi, how are you? Can you tell me what's going on here? Yes, we're in communication with the DC-10 during flight, and we are also monitoring some selected parameters in real time and engineering units on the cathode ray tube. This is accomplished by a TM link telemetering from the airplane to a station on Frost Peak, and then a microwave link down to the data center. Frost Peak is located about 75 miles northeast of Long Beach. Now, can you measure other parameters? Yes, we can. We can call up uh, any of several hundred selected parameters and display them on the tubes. Now, what are the advantages of such a system? Well, there are several advantages. One being that we can monitor the airplane in engineering units in real time during the course of a test flight. And probably more important, we can have that data available when the crew lands the airplane so that we can intelligently discuss the results of the flight. Thank you very much, George. The DC-10 is now flying at 20,000 feet, so let's take another look from our chase plane. Larry, I thought you might like to know that we've been monitoring Cliff Stout and to quote him exactly, he says, the DC-10 maneuvers like a fighter with the grace of a swan. VIPs are boarding a special DC-9 to fly to Edwards Air Force Base to be on hand for the DC-10 landing. Everything up here is obviously A-OK. -okay. Art Ballinger here at Edwards Air Force Base, and in just a few moments, the DC-10, the newest addition to the DC family of aircraft, will be landing on this runway right behind me here. And there it is. After all these months, there is a beautiful airplane coming down to land, and from where I stand, it looks to me like it's going to be a perfect landing. It's a gorgeous plane. Smooth, as I say, a perfect landing. And now, in just a few moments, we'll watch that plane taxi in. We're going to try and have you uh, talk to Cliff Stout, our test pilot, the first man to fly the DC-10. How are you, Cliff? I just want to ask you how to go. Oh, beautiful. Everything went according to plan. It's a beautiful airplane, best airplane I've ever flown. Must have been a real thrill for you. Oh, it really was. Thrill of my life. Landing smooth? Very good, very good. Take off? Beautiful. Nothing wrong at all? Nothing wrong at all. We had a beautiful bird. We could fuel up and go again right now. Thank you very much, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cliff Stout, the first man to fly the DC-10. Talk to those girls. Yeah. Well, we just can't believe it. Everything just works beautiful. Standing with me here is Mr. Jackson McGowan, president of Douglas Aircraft Corporation. And I'd like to ask you, Jack, your reactions on this first successful flight of your DC-10. Well, I've been listening to the uh, radio all the way for three hours and 25 minutes. And uh, everything I've heard is great. We'll have our debriefing in a few minutes. But uh, the pilots say it's... Uh, the best airplane they've ever flown. Well, that's what uh, I've understood, and I, just to look at it, I'd have to believe it was the most beautiful plane I've ever seen. It's a great uh, machine, and uh, we hope it's as good as we started out to design several years ago. Well, I wish you nothing but success in the future, Mr. McGowan, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. And congratulations. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Oh, that was a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. 
Very happy to have with me now Mr. D.S. Lewis, Mr. David S. Lewis, the president of McDonnell Douglas Corporation. And I know that he'd like to say something about his reactions to this first successful flight of the DC-10. Well, it's hard to have anything but just a very thrill, great thrill as a reaction. Uh, it's just been a fabulous flight, three hours and a half, first time, and uh, you saw how happy the pilots were. The yes. Just, just going like gangbusters. It must be a, a wonderful feeling after uh, the many months uh, in, in uh, the building of a plane like this for you to stand here and watch this plane come in like it has. Well, I think this is just proof of the real professionalism of the Douglas Company. The thing just worked, period. <laughs> well, to the surprise of absolutely no one, the DC-10 has successfully completed first flight. That's it from Edwards Air Force Base. We return you now to Data Control Center in Long Beach. The DC-10 is many things. Advanced technology commercial transport, wide-body luxury jet, multi-range, high-performance jumbo jet. But perhaps the most succinct description is the air transport for the 1970s and beyond. The DC-10 will become the backbone of commercial air fleets. It's so advanced in technology and design that it will still be going strong in 1985. From this point on, air travel will be safer, more comfortable, and generally better for all of us. For we'll be flying in the outstanding domain of Dimension 10.